What is up podcast listeners my name is Vinamra Kasana and you're on the Vinamra Kasana show this episode is with Indian jazz sensation Sarthi Korwar if the name is not familiar to you make sure you remember it because this is a name that will take over the Indian jazz scene uh, whatever uh, there is and part of the part of the conversation we have is why many indians and in fact many people around the world consider jazz to be something that you hear in a starbucks coffee shop while you're working on your laptop sarthi's jazz is chaotic poetic super collaborative it's it's stuff that you just jive your head to non stop i'm a fan of that i know because i uh, listen to a lot of alice coltrane and this guy just he just completely retakes the narrative and the best part as we already discussed in the conversation that you're about to listen to is it's amazing and it's a sense of pride for me as an indian to say this that this music is being made by someone who looks like me sarthi is a fantastic conversationalist super self aware and lots of very interesting insights about uh, his creative process the state of jazz how we consume music all of those wonderful things uh, in the podcast that follows now if you're listening on spotify or apple music or anywhere else on audio make sure you follow the uh, podcast so you don't miss any updates and if you're watching on youtube like share subscribe see you on the other side Hold on for a sec, and we're recording. Sarthi Korwar, first of all, great to have you on the podcast. Second of all, uh, I am so thrilled to know that you speak Hindi because I knew like thoda English scene hai because you you know like live in the UK and stuff. I could notice that English accent, uh, but the fact that you speak Hindi and Gujarati is amazing. I I was trying to search the internet to find if you if I had any clips of you. So oh, that's interesting because I don't think there's any clips of me talking in Hindi or Gujarati. Gujarati. इस वाले में कर लेते हैं थोड़ी सी. हाँ. तो हिंदी में तो बात कर ही लेता हूँ मगर आई मीन इंटरव्यू में कभी कोई पूछता ही नहीं है मेरे को कोई हिंदी में क्वेश्चन इंडिया में भी यूजली देन आई एंड अपीकिंग इन इंग्लिश ओनली आई मीन आई एम मोस्ट कम्फर्टेबल इन इंग्लिश डोट गेट बिकॉजिंग अबाउट हाउ वन आई फर्स्ट डिस्कवर यूर म्यूजिक वन आई लिसन टू मोर अराइविंग वन लिसन टू अदर लैंड वेरी रिसेंटली एंड देन आई ऑल्सो लिसन टू माई इस्ट इज योर बेस्ट राइट लाइव uh when i looked up the name it said sarathi korwar and also i i saw ads for more arriving on spotify a couple of months ago and uh, okay. that sort of got me to your music so kudos to those guys i was surprised yeah. to find ki ye ek indian bana raha hai and i told you like that's the same feeling i had with peter cat recording co when i heard them like this is coming out of india uh and you had something very interesting to say about that about how it's you didn't grow up with people who who looked like you making music that you liked yeah absolutely i think like when you think about role models or just representation ideas mm. of like you know growing up um it really shapes the way of what you think is possible you know mm. put very simply like if you're a kid growing up i grew up in chennai in ahmedabad chennai mm. and um the bands i with that dug around at the time were like parikrama yeah um i don't know uh zero like all these like college bands you right. know who, the pentagram Amazing, like really, really amazing. Band. Pentagram Indian is the Ocean. band uh, with uh, Randolph Correa and uh, Vishal yeah. Dudmani, right? That band. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, epic band. I mean, they're like amazing. Mm. But, um, and you know, you could sort of identify with the stuff that they were singing about and playing, but also like there was hardly any sort of jazz musicians or people who like mm. the kind of music I was listening to as well that looked like me at the time. Um. But yeah, so when you said you know you felt kind of uh, you could identify with the stuff that I was doing or uh, mm. the Peter Cat stuff, um, that feels really good. Is all. That's yeah, nice. yeah. I'm 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 glad that that <clears throat> that's how you feel as well. Because I I noticed that you know you have about thirty two thousand followers, thirty two thousand monthly listeners on Spotify, and I often ask this question from people who have large audiences. What what does that feel like to to know that you know thirty two thousand people tune in to listen to to your creation that you've put out um, every month and like they they just come on your page every month and like can you quantify these people can you can you point out an individuals how how does that feel like it's a difficult thing right with anything on the internet I think it's the way people consume music especially on all these streaming platforms like Spotify mm. Apple Music whatever I mean. <sighs> I don't know how many people are actually listening to the music and how many people the music is affecting. You know, often mm. like we live in this kind of culture of playlist culture where you just kind of like, you know, you put on your Discover Weekly or whatever it is, you know, and you just consume so much music. And I find mm. myself especially when I'm using these platforms to not take music as seriously um 
as I would if I was just like downloading an album, buying it, like sitting and listening to it. Mm. My personal preference now, like, is leaning towards like you know, trying to like look albums again and like try to really connect with something that I've been meaning to listen to for a while or you know mm. I haven't. Um, it's almost so easy now, right, to just go on Spotify and then just like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna listen to like. I don't know indie indie India or like rap in India yeah. or like something and then yeah, just like you're on listen that to that whole thing and it's like yeah. a great way to discover people sure but like mm-hmm. also I feel like there's an argument that you don't end up actually discovering anything because all these things are based on algorithms that's that like yeah tell you what your taste in music is you know and um, it's quite an interesting uh, uh, exercise to try and do you know if you try and look at any of these playlists uh, online um they break down every song into like tempo feel genre mm. like there are these like seven or eight different kind of uh, criteria that every song is basically judged on uh, or categorized on and if you like any one of them then it's going to just show you more songs that's basic match all those hmm. um criteria and so it's like <laughs> is that really the way you want to discover new music and actually are you you know widening your bubble or is your bubble just getting smaller and smaller wow man uh, sorry very I, roundabout way of no 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 no, no 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 i, I want to like, stay uh, i want to stay on this because i i was having a discussion i've had multiple discussions with friends around this how our spotify is don't look the same to us mm-hmm. like we know that it's it's music that is on our phone but i can't recognize it i don't know where what these artists are i know like i have a sense of understanding where they come from it's it's random exotic names and i keep on playing it because it's more convenient the discover weekly gets more and more interesting and complex by by the you know by by every week but i have to look for the guys that i organically put in the playlist that's gone that's completely gone the organic part of like discovering music and being able to listen to an album from uh, you know song number 1 till the uh, till the last song is is just gone i think that's the thing is that past listening you know mm. like you're actively doing less and less to engage with music like you're now literally just touching one like you're touching your screen once maybe twice and then you can just stop mm. to think you don't need to think and you can just listen to music for an hour or two and i'm just questioning whether that passive approach is uh you know actually affecting you um, like, yeah. you know like how much of that music then i mean i know how i consume music on spotify and often a song has to be really 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 amazing for me to like hit like or even mm-hmm. pay attention to it because like when i'm on like walking somewhere or just like running or exercising so much of that music i can't even remember like you ask me what did i listen to and i'll be like i don't know like it was just like exactly. discover weekly <laughs> and you know i found myself doing that and i was like well actually i'm wasting a lot of time and i'm not letting music affect me the same way it used to affect me when i was a teenager you know when mm. i used to like go like really really get into music and listen to albums and talk about like artists that really like excited me and so i was i just felt like it was time for me to try and like try different platforms try and you know go back to listening to vinyl maybe or yeah. you know if you don't have the privilege of owning vinyl or not you know that's totally fine bandcamp like even youtube i feel like youtube's in a way a better way to like also it is. like just go into like typing stuff and like finding people's albums but um yeah i mean going back to your like first question about how does it feel mm. so it's a strange feeling like i think at part of me obviously feels great There's, there's so many people who are listening to me and maybe know who I am or like are they, my music is affecting them in some way equally i'm suspicious deeply suspicious of it like and i don't know um how many of those people i really hope that it's a lot of people but hmm. equally i take it with a pinch of salt and i'm like great it's doing what it's doing hmm. um i'm just going to keep doing what i do and hope that you know it affects yeah people. i i wonder because you were talking about how <clears throat> you know you can always go back to the organic sources of music discovery that is getting to a vinyl store picking out an obscure vinyl uh, you know putting it on your record player and then really letting the whole record unpack and and see what it has for you like it's maybe something made in the 80s that's just lying in the in the dusty section you pick it up and you voila you're in like some genre you never even that's not even on youtube right um but there's <clears throat> also this other idea which i think uh like i i'm trying to understand this um 
when because you're also creating a lot of music you're playing a lot of music constantly uh do you do you have people in your life who recommend music to you and then you sort of enter this whole like deep listening territory where you sit down you know you know fold your legs uh and then listen to music uh absorb it or like is how does how does, your, how does your music taste evolve, evolve basically that's a roundabout way of asking a very simple question yeah yeah no that's a really good question i mean i have people around me who like send me music like friends hmm. um almost actually more friends who aren't musicians like just friends from outside of music who like are into stuff that like will send me a link to something like hey check this out i really like this um and then i actively because i have a couple of radio shows i'm always like looking out for like something new and something that i might like and sometimes do like online like call outs for submissions and stuff so i get to hear a lot of music um yeah that's kind of how it goes but i rarely now sit down uh in my house and mm-hmm. listen just to music which is quite yeah. sad really i wish i did more of it um i mainly consume music while i'm uh in transit you know like mm-hmm. maybe a lot of people but when i'm taking the train when i'm exercising when i'm you know and i look forward to those moments because i'm like okay i'm going to be away from you know everything i'm just going to listen all like yeah. you know um so yeah that's how i mainly consume music and i get kind of recommendations from a close set of like you know close friends yeah um yeah it's i i also think that we are in the era of the rise of easy listening playlists because we were briefly touching upon that before uh and how i it's ironical that when people especially in the groups that i hang i hang out in they say bro kuch chill chala de and and that, that that word chill uh is so ambiguous um that when you search it on spotify you'll get everywhere from low fi beats to uh john and on a swag house to even coffee table jazz and that chill encompasses pretty much what most people are tuning into spotify for especially spotify right mm. and and you're ex- exactly right about how you can't really remember that music it's just it's just pleasant background i don't know like sweetness that you can just exactly. keep playing as you keep you know doing the things that you want to do because it's strange to introduce mystery and deviation to a group of friends where the lowest common denominator of music is generally accepted unless they're all musicians i don't have a lot of musician friends i'm not a musician mm-hmm. particularly myself so like if i would play your album right like that would involve someone else who has to have at least a basic access to jazz to even go through the entire thing because it's not something that people are like oh bro ye thoda heavy ho raha hai ye thoda mm-hmm. ye thoda ja raha hai no iske andar let's yeah. just you know keep it chill yeah i think it goes back to that what we said about passive uh, consumption you know mm. it's that uh, it's really it kind of is really strange for me to think about like how much music yeah people consume of like you say like easy listening ambient playlists that mm-hmm. just like it's like i've never been like someone who's been able to play music in the background while working i just can't like if i'm listening to music i'm listening to music like my partner she's often like why is the music so loud i'm like that's because i'm listening to it like it's not just something that's <laughs> happening yeah like, you know at the background so i've always like been able to like fortunately i think like actively engage when it's playing mm. and i think it that's the thing it's about finding friends or like you know groups of people who are like really into music mm. you know who like love music and music is something that like i keep saying is like it's affecting you in some way so i think you know if you were to play my album i totally agree with people who who don't actively listen to music it'll be like ha mm. huh, like bhai ye kya ho raha hai like you know it's too much like mm. dissonance itna loud kyu hai itna you know so it's like you need to find people who are open to like new sounds who want to actually understand you know yeah how this stuff is evolving and um yeah i think but you know i, I always feel like music always finds a way to those people you know yeah. um and that's just a positive way of thinking about it but yeah yeah there's uh, this jeff buckley story about how he was in a really dark place uh in his college days and he discovered nusrat fateh ali khan and that sort of helped him save his life right and get get back on track and you know become a musician properly um now obviously you said that you know you have to be open to new experiences to experience jazz and 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 stuff that you would normally not normally not listen to uh what has been like the response to your music and albums in india considering that you've also you know collaborated with delhi sultanate 
MC Mawali, Prabdeep, right? A bunch of other guys, right? So what has been the response? Because I know that there's still a very high barrier to entry when it comes to jazz in India. Like people, it's, it's, it's small yeah. charm circles, yeah. No, totally. I think it's an interesting uh, situation because I'm not entirely sure how people react to my music. I mean, I think a large part of my um, success or whatever you want to call it in India or visibility in India, mm. I think, um, and maybe I'm being cynical, but I think it's because I'm an Indian based in the UK making mm. music that's seen as successful here <laughs> and I'm on labels that are like you know, Ninja Tune and Leaf and whatever yeah. Gearbox. And people see that as like a success story. Interesting. And so people think, oh, cool, this guy's like made it, he's he making interesting stuff. People, The people who they consider influencers like Giles Peterson, Fortet, Floating Points, all of them are like, you know, involved in my career. Hmm. So it's like, oh, he must be amazing. Or he must be cool. Let's give him some props, you know. <laughs> but then when it comes to actually listening to my music, I don't know how many people are into it, you know. Um, and that's just me like saying, I don't know, I actually don't know because I don't really see anybody else in India really making this kind of music. Yeah, I haven't seen it either. That's, like there yeah. is a jazz scene and, you know, it's great. I mean, it's evolving, hmm. but it's also very kind of cocktail jazz, like <laughs> straight ahead jazz. And that was yeah. never my thing. Like we play in clubs, we play like, you know, it gets dirty. It's like punk. There's an element of punk to it. So... You know, I, I would much rather, for instance, play it like a, where rock bands play rather than mm. at a jazz club. That's just, you know, because yeah. that's how the music is. It's rowdy. It's like often dissonant. It's, you know, it's, it's all the reasons why I love jazz, basically. Yeah. But, I got, um, yeah. Go on, go on. Yeah. No. So I think um, in India, it's a, it's a, it's, I'm not sure, honestly, like how um, my music is viewed. I think I'm definitely viewed as an outsider. Mm. I don't, I don't live there. And I don't make music. Um, I often collaborate with a lot of Indians, like you say. Right. But um, I'm definitely, I think, somebody who's, you know, who's from India, but who lives outside. And equally here, it's the opposite, you know, who's someone who's from outside, but lives here. It's just like... Um, Interesting. Yeah, that's how I think, anyway. But yeah, maybe about that... Ask people who yeah, about that comment uh, in, in, the, in the Indian jazz cocktail scene. I think that's so true. Uh, I you remember this guy Kenny G? He's not even rap exactly. He's not even jazz exactly. Yes, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hey, man, he's really funny on Twitter though. Yeah, everybody. I was Kenny Twitter. G. Go check him out on Twitter. He's really funny. He's quite self-aware. This is what <laughs> it's quite funny because yeah, everyone loves to hate on Kenny G and like yeah, of course, you know, it's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> the music is terrible. He's kind of self-aware. That's his only saving grace. That I just like he knows just, what he's doing. Yeah, I just remember him as the guy with the curly hair on yeah, um, like, a, like a CD that my parents have that they played when they bought the new Bose sound theater system to impress guests right. and stuff. And so like, mm. okay, so like, it's like, uh, I, I'm not sure. Like it, it makes the whole vibe non-Bollywoody and stuff. It's like some sure. grand, you know, cocktail brunch event is going to take place, but nothing really happens. People are like, you know, can you put it it's back terrible, to Bollywood man. and Sufi? It's basically killing jazz because it's easy listening music. It's It's nothing to do with jazz. Like you say, yeah. I mean, just because he's playing a saxophone doesn't make it jazz. <laughs> you know, jazz is so much more about the processes involved in how you're thinking about the music and yeah. what you're doing with the music. Um, just because you're playing a saxophone doesn't make it jazz, you know. And uh, yeah, he's, I mean, people have a lot of hate for him. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is probably like valid <laughs> because he's kind of, you know, in the sense, a lot of people think of jazz and think of Kenny G. Yeah. So, and that's doing a lot of harm for the rest of us. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Yeah, it's like Abba is pop music for Indian parents. You know, the, the same idea, but there's so much more. Um, there's, I, I, I read about bop, like hard pop music in Jack Kerouac's On the Road. And I was always curious to find out what that music sounds like. Uh, and then, you know, I listened sadly to the hard bop list on Spotify. There were some good ones in there. But I totally get the element of the, the sort of punk rockiness of the sort of jazz that you play. It's very in your face, very loud, very dissonant, right? And uh, it's something about, because I've been to some jazz clubs in, in New York as well. I forget which one I was at. And I've had like, I've attended a couple of recitals with uh, 
some Berkeley students, and I've, I, I could find myself jiving in, in a strange way, in, in a sort of dance that's not probably the most publicly acceptable because it involves vigorous movements of the head and like the torso like this, and you just, because you, you just have to move so fast, right? Um, and there's something about that that just I try to introduce to my friends, uh, but for some reason, everyone falls for the classic coffee table jazz that you hear in the Starbucks and stuff. And it's very hard for people, for, for me to get people to sort of get attached to this, this, this music that doesn't make sense on the, on the outside. Yeah, no, totally. And that, you know, for every valid reason, I think it's a culture, like, and it's very mm. difficult to like introduce people to a culture that's not happening around them. Like, you mm. know, it's happening, mm. for example, in the UK or New York, like for a reason, like it's here and like people have learned jazz. They've also taken influences from grime and sound system culture, from blues, from punk, from all these other things. And like, that's what they're making their music their own. Whereas, I mean, I kind of draw a parallel with like, jazz to what's happening with hip hop in India, you know, hmm. like in the sense that people are really making it their own. You know? Right. They're finding a language, they're finding a style, they're finding, and when I mean language, I don't just mean like language literally, but like a whole kind of language around the kind of design and the, the look and the, you know, just everything about the scene um, that is kind of local and hmm. people can get into that because it's speaking to people locally, like in different parts of the country yeah and it's got to do that man otherwise why like you know you have to ask yourself why why should anybody get into jazz for instance it's not speaking to them it's nobody who looks like them making the music that they you know well yeah why why should anybody be into jazz and that's a very valid question like you know hmm. for me it spoke to me at a certain time and like i find myself creatively very like enriched through it and i find myself like being able to express myself and my like whatever my art is through it well so fine but i can't expect other people just because we look the same to be mm. into it because people's life experiences are totally different yeah know? and so that's valid totally valid so your spotify bio reads something along the lines of how you're trying to reclaim indo jazz and i'm just wondering if you could help me unpack what that means yeah, I mean, it's a pretty grand statement, gotta, gotta say. Um, I mean, basically, you know, with a lot of what gets called Indo jazz, it's mm -hmm. just a lot of what we hate to call fusion music. You know, it's just like yeah. a lot of like really, really virtuosic players coming together and just like playing, a, just jamming, but without any real common sensibilities or uh, any respect for any songs yeah what would be an example of that i mean any man this every weekend before covid for example there'd be like one fusion concert in like delhi bombay mm. where it'd be like prominent jazz figures prominent indian classical fi figures coming together and playing and it's just pretty pretty boring to be honest for me mm. like you know at yeah. first it was exciting to see all these players who are all amazing musicians but none of them have really spent that much time with both traditions and any commonalities mm. or to really make any sort of relevant, like interesting music. So for me, I mean, just when people say Indo jazz, I just wanted to be able to, I feel like I'm in a position with the kind of vantage point around Indian classical music and jazz, having spent mm. some time in both traditions that I thought I could like add to the conversation around it. Basically. And when we talk about like, Spiritual jazz, you know, often people talk about um, music made in the 70s, 80s by people like Alice Coltrane, like Joe Hero Sanders, all these people who took a lot from like Indian culture. You mm. know? And a lot of that was represented fairly like inaccurately in a lot of their music, like with some really badly played Tanpura or like out of tune sitar or you know, something. <laughs> So yeah. I wanted to basically have an ensemble of people that was equal part Indian, equal part like jazz musicians from the UK to like retell or rework a lot of songs and like the Upaj Collective basically is, is that's what we do a lot of the mm. time where it's kind of just saying, look, this is 2020. This is what like Indo jazz could sound like. That's all. It's pretty simple. Yeah. You, uh, <laughs> 
I can't help but think there is a there's a massive uh, sound sample library that is pretty much available online, uh, and you can see this even in the soundtracks that Disney movies had in the 1930s when they showed something akin to the Middle East and India, and the sounds that they had all the way till you know the sound libraries you have right now is some variation of an electric sitar that sounds horrible. Uh, you know, I don't know for it's like very Alibaba Charlie Chaplin type ki jo ek tune aati hai na again and again and again. And after a while, you're like, okay, if all the producers around the world are making this and labeling this as the Indian sound, we're fucked because there's clearly a lot more that doesn't get communicated, right? There's so much more. Exactly. I mean, basically, it's an idea of representation. You know, like if the only Indian music you're gonna hear is from your Alibaba or Aladdin soundtrack. Hmm. then you're going to think indian music is a certain thing yes now there's no if you wanted to use that that's fine if all these other facets of indian music are represented well in the west you know but they aren't it's hmm. honest like that is the only access to a lot of music that people get and it's lazy and it's easy and it's just honestly like disrespectful right so that's the problem that's the basic point of representation where you want to be able to say it like different facets and nuances of your culture be represented as accurately as possible right like in the west and that's never happened historically so yeah that's what you end up with you know you end up with people thinking oh this is what a tabla sounds like this is you know and also like just words that have lost meaning completely like hmm. spiritual meditative yeah transformative. these words that are just very lazily attached to consciousness i love that one yeah. open your third eye the, the whole yeah, yeah i know yeah, yeah so i mean that's all i'm just kind of calling out a lot of this kind of exoticism that's hmm. and like demystifying a lot of this stuff be like look guys ultimately is also just people making music like this music yeah. being made by like actual human beings who have to live and like make their money to like feed their families yeah so like not everything is spiritual yeah there's a there's a large sort of emergence of creatives all across the world that are doing that in their respective fields i i often think of uh the author ji tile uh who i also want to get on the podcast and he yeah. he often um you know he wanted to sort of portray the more grimy the grungy the the individual failings of of human beings in india and he wrote his books and stuff but because he wanted to get back against the whole notion of india as a country of mangoes and sunny days and elephants and you know like this whole uh, i don't know everything is wine colored and nice and um, you know kids play in the park all day long all of that it's it's a very and i mean i lived in the us for four years myself as a college student so i also felt that like if everyone said you know like chicken tikka masala khate that's the indian dish right i'm like it's not indian it it was it was created in the uk so uh, after a certain point you do ask yourself though like there is a lot of complex complexity i have to communicate so i can no longer just be myself i also have to be the character the representative of so of the people who don't have voices here so that's the burden that a lot of people will feel if you're mm-hmm. kind of somebody of color you know i can you know you speak for myself where you feel like suddenly you feel representative of like a larger some something larger than yourself mm-hmm. but i think that's a trap as well you know because ultimately if you're trying to say to people that look we're all complex mm-hmm. uh, human beings like you can't you know we're not black and white then to say that you're representative of a larger population is equally like you're falling in the same trap yes so what you need to do and i think something i realized over time was that i can only be representative of myself and right. even on a given day i can't even be representative of my whole self you know like who knows what i'm feeling like this podcast i might have had a good breakfast before i came on yeah. i might be in a good mood i might be in a bad mood like do you have a good breakfast yeah i had a good breakfast man thanks oh, well. i was like you know like am i doing myself justice by this like you can mm. you can go on and on there's no end to it right so i think ultimately the end goal should be that you feel like you're not being misrepresented and that mm. your own narrative is being shaped accurately by, by yourself and the people who are talking about you hmm. especially if you're in the public eye in any way you know but even if you're not like you say with food you know like chicken tikka like you feel personally offended when somebody says like tum to ghar pe curry khate honge ye curry kya hota hai yaar curry the first time bacho har roz nahi khate hum curry ha also curry like who calls it curry like no one ever called it curry in my household right so like 
small things like that but they kind of get to you over time yeah. also the gujarati obsession with adding a little bit of sugar to the curry that's also the lost the food sab mein hota hai yeah <laughs> but i'm actually fortunately don't have a sweet tooth so hamare yeah. ghar pe itna sugar nahi lagta hai but uh, most of my family yes sugar yeah. fiends <laughs> Yeah, I know something about Indians. Ki yar, desert to khana padega. Thodi si mithai. Yeah, uh-huh. it's, it's it's a standard. Wherever I go, I get served chai already with sugar. They don't even ask. Like, ye to dalna hi padega. Uh-huh. And so if you say like, okay, can I have green tea or coffee? They look at you like you're a hey, foreigner. Kya kar raha hai sir? <laughs> Jana hai sir. With like Indian chai, if you don't put sugar, na, it's basically uh-huh. impossible to drink. I know. Because it's so strong. Hoti hai Indian chai. Malab, it's tough. Sugar yeah. does do a lot of good. I mean. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not an expert on sugar. I don't really. <laughs> no, I know. Yeah, yeah sugar is bad. I I know for a fact sugar is bad. Uh, yeah. but I also I, at the same time feel like, uh, you've got a short life. You got to enjoy some some nice short food. life. Yeah. Uh, Sarthi, also, now that you've collaborated with the uh, you know uh, MC Mawali and Pradeep and stuff, did these guys help make the music more accessible to Indian audiences? And what was it like working with them? Because one, uh, since you're you know primarily doing the drums, and then you know if. I'm assuming you're a multi instrumentalist. I've seen a couple of uh, your your performances on YouTube and stuff, but they're in they're in charge of the vocals. They're in charge of the of the message that gets communicated in the, in the local language in their own flavor. So how do you make sure that it's what you want? How much leeway do you give to them? That 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 sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I think basically the conversations I had with the ACs on the on the album hmm. was that look, guys, like we need to. agree on a basic message you know what the song might be about and then ultimately i give up control because it's all about giving up control for me like mm. i want people to be able to express themselves and feel invested in the song as much as i do you know if i tell somebody to just like if i give them lyrics to rap like what is the purpose of them being on a song like you know they have to find ways to make that song their own yeah and that's a way to like obviously connect with a lot of people i think like yeah definitely having people like uh, mc mawali and prab on the record suddenly opened it up to a lot of people who wouldn't have heard my music before you know mm. and um yeah absolutely like for me i write a lot of songs but a lot of my songs are about giving up that control it's about finding people who I would like to collaborate with hmm. who I know after a few conversations I will be able to agree with on whatever okay. they do right it's like being in a band ultimately you know I always want to work with people who I can trust and whose voices I admire and I want to feature you know I want uh, MC Mawali to talk about the stuff he wants to talk about in the way he wants to hmm. you know it's just that this time as opposed to a lot of the MCs that I worked with on this on more arriving they had never worked with a live band before hmm especially they're all Marco, recording artists like they would yeah like they worked with, you know they have producers yeah. who make them beats and songs and then they rap on them hmm or many of them produce and that's cool but they never worked with like a band of people who could play like live like you know all of us being sort of jazz musicians in some way right um and that was something i was very aware of telling them was like look guys like this song will feature you but equally there might be times when there's this like really really dirty blaring saxophone that might cover a couple of your lyrics and you've got to be okay with that you know so it was something that i think sonically they had to come to terms as well cuz you know mcs are also just used to being front and center of yeah. every song the songs about mm-hmm. them whereas i was like skana is about everyone in the band this one um so fortunately i think everybody kind of saw that as an opportunity to try something different for them you know mm. um and yeah i took to it really well but i think i was very aware of that before going into like recording with them mm. like guys like i need to tell you that like this is not probably going to be the same as any other recording session you've done yeah i was uh, i was smoking a j with a friend and i was playing a uh, coolie and um <clears throat> i had to in- incentivize him by saying ki prabdeep iske andar hai sun to ab hum chala rahe the and we were playing the song right and the specific moment that i had goosebumps was when there's maybe like a detune sax or something going off in the background as prabdeep is at full like crescendo and it was amazing i've because i'm so used to listening to you know like the whole azadi records roster on uh, on standard beats that i i can predict right to some extent having them on a genre that i appreciate 
uh, and having that genre have some vocals like that, that was piece on the cake on me. Like it's, I, I don't think, I, I hope more people make stuff like this where, you know, MCs uh, sort of forego of the disciplines that they've trained in and, and, and do more stuff like this uh, because I don't know, it just, it's, it's, it's so interesting to have two parts of a brain, which are, which, which completely, which are completely different, which process music differently. Probably music means an entirely different, th- uh, different thing to me. Yours, an entirely different thing. And when they fuse together, it's like something about, you know, how when you take psychedelics, uh, parts of your brain, they don't work together, work together. It, it just felt like that for me. Yeah, no, totally. I, yeah, I hear you completely. And I think I really do wish more people use like that as well and take chances mm. because um, also live, these things are amazing to witness. Like, you know, <laughs> having MCs on stage with you and it really going off and people taking control. Um, it's, you know, this is what I make music for, man. Like, this is why, like, you know, the albums are great, but really it comes to life when you're playing it live. And when you're there on stage with people and there's a connection with people in the audience and, you know, um, that's what I, well, that's what I miss right now the most anyway. Hmm. But also is something... Yeah, how long has it been since you've uh, been live? I think the last gig gig we did was in March. Uh, I did like a gig <laughs> the day before lockdown got hit uh, in London. Yeah. Um, that was cool. That was a really fun gig to do. Um, but it was just like an improv gig, you know. Mm. And um, yeah, since then, basically six, seven months now. Not so you've been, you've been, you've been doing st- stuff over Zoom, though. I saw a couple of videos online. Yeah, I've been doing stuff remotely. Uh, we also filmed like a pre-recorded like a uh, show for London Jazz Festival, which mm. is there on nineteenth November. Right. And um, yeah, we're doing some bits for television and stuff here. But no gigs. We had a gig next week in Hamburg that was cancelled. Milan got cancelled. I mean, mm. we had, man, this summer was going to be amazing <laughs> for mm. me. I was playing Glastonbury for the first time. Oh, so damn. Had, yeah, all that just got canned. So, so uh, is, this, is, it, is this a bad time for you existentially in the sense you're, I mean, how, yeah, I think what, so. what do you, what do you, what do you do with your entire day? Like, do you just do managerial stuff? Do you make music alone and send it to people you collaborate with? What, what does your day look like then? Um, right now my day looks like I'm going through a lot of music that I recorded with a band in August. So we got mm. a chance to go to a recording studio for two days. Uh, it's an amazing recording studio called real world studios. Mm. And it's, uh, it's owned by or set up by Peter Gabriel, you know, legendary, like, Oh, from, uh, Peter from Gabriel. Genesis, like, you know, with like Phil Collins and these people. Yes, basically. yes, 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 yes. Um, and he set it up back in the 80s and it's an amazing recording space so we spent two days like just making music and i'm now going through all those files and like basically making a new album out of those jams so Mm. editing stuff producing stuff that kind of thing um i read on twitter like quite an interesting quote that kind of sums it up for me a little bit it's like you know everything's been cancelled and the sadness that i'm feeling not like out of stuff being cancelled but it's from not wanting to plan for new stuff because yeah. you got the energy to plan. And I think that's totally true for me. Like I'm, I've stopped planning mm. for fun things in the future because I'm like, I don't know if it's going to happen, you know? And I think actually the weight of that, not being able to look forward to stuff is what's actually uh, most depressing. Um, as, as I think, and everybody kind of shares that at some level. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a tough time, man. It's no two ways about it. You know, of course there's, you know, ways to find it, find positives out of it, but equally it's okay to just say it sucks and it does suck. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Don't you guys have another lockdown coming up very soon or is that already yeah, Thursday? A so we're talking on a Tuesday. We're yeah. talking on, it's the 3rd of November. Hmm. Um, lockdown starts on the 5th of November Yeah. for a month. Yeah. My sister goes to college in the UK and she, uh, got bored at home because she was here for pretty much all of summer and then she got back was excited about attending classes and stuff and then they imposed lockdown so she's living in a small room uh, because she arrived latest uh, among all her roommates and it's just like going basically like living in two different rooms in two different countries and not really being able to see either of the outside worlds no it's crazy i really have a lot of sympathy for university going students man like they Mm. are just trapped it's like a jail right now Mm. like they are just trapped there and you know universities in the uk exist on these massive fees that people pay that we have to pay and um, they can't go online they can't justify like you know 
staying yeah. afloat basically so it's tough man i really i uh, have really damn. so i want to change the topic to back let's talk about your childhood and let, let's not let these gloomy times get the best of us where did you go to college i went to college at ferguson college mm. in pune interesting yeah so what I was that like i've heard many great. things about it being a stoner city but also a city that promotes music could you yeah. talk about that yeah exactly both those things <laughs> basically i was there 2005 to 2009 mm. um i went to ferguson i um did a bsc in environmental science Damn. and um i was you know all about just being like a renewable energy expert or i don't know urban planning or something and it's just but you never played been, music at that point i played music i played music hmm. i was um playing tabla i was playing drums by that point hmm. uh, but i really started taking drum lessons when i got to pune hmm. um when i was 17 um so i mean pune is a great city um for at the time anyway it was great because it's you know there's so many universities so many colleges lots hmm. of young people from all over the country um and the music scene was great because like there was people always people coming from bombay after doing gigs in bombay they'd come to pune and do a gig there hmm. you know or lots of college bands so it was a really great kind of culture around obviously around film with fdii and the national film archives hmm. so i kind of like just got myself into like watching a lot of films like checking a lot of music playing in college bands and that was my life for like 3 4 years and i loved it you know it was quite an inspiring time for me actually i stopped studying because my teachers were so bad yeah so i stopped going to college really i just was i'd just go for exams and pass somehow yeah i uh, wasn't interested and um yeah i just met people at college who were you know into music and shared a lot of sensibilities and yeah it was a great time i, I kind of learned a lot was it were, were, did you Uh, consume the holy trifecta of pink floyd the doors and uh, the black sabbath which is often a common trope in colleges as you you know experiment with marijuana for the first time and then somehow 70s rock bands just emerge as the go to playlist yeah so somehow i was i mean i listened to uh, sabbath hmm. and um, floyd not so much but like sabbath a lot i was like 15 16 Mm. Um so by the time I was 17 18 I was already I was kind of listening more to like uh indie stuff like I was listening to I don't know stuff like Iron and Wine and uh, Kings mm. of Convenience but also like jazz uh Cold Train Cannonball Adderley uh a lot of like the Doors the Doors for me were like my favorite band ever uh, a lot of Hendrix mm. a lot of new reggae um so that was kind of what I was doing <coughs> mostly um but yeah again like you know just like hanging out in, at home and just like yeah just listening to a lot of music getting stoned just chilling <laughs> it's great i like, feel that so how long has it been since you graduated from college it's been what 10 years 15 years i don't know like how how old are you 2008 is when i graduated from college yeah. so it's been 12 years 12 years wow 12 i graduated years. in 2019 man Yeah, I mean so to be fair, I that was my undergrad and then I did my postgrad here in the UK. Hmm. Um but I did that much later so I did that in 2011 and 12. So the last time I was at like an academic institution it was yeah 2012 uh yeah. here in London. Uh yeah. And It's also a long time ago actually. I I don't know like I I all I saw the video that you have with Zia Ahmed where he's uh there's these tropes of him sitting down in the music video. and uh sort of looking at uh a picture of Winston Churchill Mr Bean all those things and it's it's an interesting juxtaposition because Zia is obviously brown and you know these these icons are all white so i'm wondering as to is that like a reflection of what you feel uh is that maybe like a stylized version of of the experience of being brown in the uk or is it like it's it's strange right do you listen to indian news do you listen to the uk news like and how much do you watch like south asian news in the uk because it's because i understand that the the experience of being brown in the uk and sort of sort of diasporic experiences it just leaves a lot of things unanswered i i i can't relate to the experience because i i've just been in one country 
Uh, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's all those things that you're saying. Basically, the song that Zia is on with me is called Bowl. Mm, Bowl. And right, that whole right. song is basically about how it's a kind of ironic, kind of sarcastic take on how represented South Asians might feel in the UK. Mm. Like when all your heroes are Winston Churchill and Oasis and, you know, all all white, basically. Um, how much of yourself do you see in, in culture? Um mm. And that's what, you know, Zia's reality has been like being British Asian and it's something that I've come to learn and experience over the time that I've been here, you know, it took me a while to understand that like the British, ex- like you say, the British Asian experience is so different, can be so different from one of uh, somebody, a brown skinned person living in India or even a first generational migrant like myself, you know, mm. who hasn't grown up here, who hasn't had to go to schools where you're the only brown kid in school, um, you know, who people have had difficulty saying your name. You had to, you know, speak one language at home and another with your friends. Like, hmm. we never had that. You know, we grew up very privileged that way. Hmm. So I think that's, you know, something that I've come to realize and understand and appreciate uh, of people here. And um, yeah, what was the second part of the question? No, it was just that for you as well, right? Because... अभी हम लोगों ने थोड़ी हिंदी में ही बात करी ठीक है बड़ा एक और इंटरेस्टिंग चीज है क्योंकि आई लाइक आई एम अज्यूमिंग यू स्पेंड प्रीटी मच ऑल योर टीन्स इन इंडिया एंड देन व्हेन यू आर सॉर्ट ऑफ अराइविंग एट द आईडिया ऑफ आई एम एन इंडिविजुअल आई हैव लाइक आई हैव एन ईगो इन द सेंस नॉट लाइक योर योर कॉकी बट लाइक एन ईगो लाइक यू हैव अ यू हैव एन आइडेंटिटी राइट एंड सो यू अराइव इन द यूके एज अ मेड पर्सन एंड देन एंड देन यू लाइक व्हाट न्यूज़ डू यू लिसन टू डू यू केयर अबाउट व्हाट्स हैपनिंग इन द यूके do you sort of care about what's happening in india that sort of thing because even though you reside in the uk uh do you like read south asian I, I, i'm i'm just trying to understand where you get yeah no totally i mean i personally about, yeah. do a lot i'm um i i follow the news in india a lot um mm. i mean i come back to india two times a year i made a very conscious decision that i'd never wanted to come back to india and just go visit my family you know like once every december like all your nris do Mm. Uh, I wanted to have a current and like constant relationship with people working in India so like for me now like going back and like working with MCs working with other musicians being part of the music scene in India a little bit has helped me like engage with what's happening right now you know mm. in the country and I'm very like lucky to have that and I constantly want to keep that going because for me you know i don't want this idea of india to ever become like a nostalgic thing like ha yaar wo to you know childhood mein tha mai kitna tha tab kitna acha tha like you know all these like rose tinted ideas of how my childhood and life in india was yeah aur ab to sab bigad gaya yaar ab to sab you know it's it's not true and it's like there's lots of really interesting things happening and i want to stay like connected with that so for me personally I'll, you know i'll always have like my head in both places like in yeah. the uk and india and like over time i've always felt like the space geographical space between the spaces is getting smaller and smaller you know like i can spend more time in india and still be here and vice versa so that's my plan anyway like to you know spend mm. more time in both places interesting yeah i think musical collaboration also does that like what what i'm getting from what what you're saying is uh the india that you sort of grew up in largely became the india that your parents represented like the land of your childhood right something that you talk in a very dreamy fashion about something that's in the past but doing musical collaborations and just checking out the scene is your foot in the door to make sure that you're contemporary like there's a the meaning that you attach to india is your own as opposed to something exactly. given to you by your family inherited rather exactly i didn't want to fall into that trap ki i start thinking about india with this nostalgic view Mm. only you know i wanted to st- it to stay contemporary and i wanted to stay connected with it um and that's it that's you know that's because wh- i feel like that's where people suffer from like and like kind of romanticized ideas of of, mm. of of the past and maybe it wasn't actually as great as i make it out to be but it was because it was my childhood i'll always see it as like really yeah great but like politically as well you know like i'm very aware of what's happening and I want to be kind of engaged and be able to contribute, you know, through my music or through activism whatever, you know. Mm. I think for me it's really important also like with the kind of music that I'm making that I want to be able to engage more people in India. Like it it it's something that I do feel strongly about and I feel like mm. there is a space for it. 
um, like we've said, like there's not that much music like this yes. around. So I feel like there's there's a space for it. And like every time I go, I do obviously meet people like like, like yourself who like who found a way to connect with this. And I'm like, hmm. yeah, man, of course there's people. Why wouldn't there be people who will understand this and like who hmm. it'll affect and who, you know? So yeah. So w- when you arrive in India, let's say, do you like do all the touristy stuff? Do you actively figure out okay what's what's the music scene in this specific suburb or city like and can i meet the thought leader or the guy running it and, and then understand other tangent from it like how how do you approach that hey, now i'm kind of in the scene enough where like i mean i go home i go to pune hmm. i'll stay there for a bit and then i'll have gigs usually hmm. so i'm in bombay delhi bangalore you know a lot um gigging i've got friends there new friends old friends uh hmm. I mean, other musicians at festivals or you know at gigs um if there's collaborations that i want to do then i'll make that happen book time mm. in the studio do that um so yeah i mean i'm I, and i spend about 2 3 months a year in india you know interesting so it's quite a lot and um yeah i kind of continue i want to continue doing that <clears throat> and in terms of i guess because jazz is a very improvisational genre as we've as everyone listens to and stuff uh do you find it challenging to work with people who are trained in a different capacity like in a different way because i read something very interesting about how you know musical savants are people who can uh recreate pieces from memory but they can uh what's the what, i forgot like it's it's something like they can recreate pieces but they can never create their own like they're good at and like you know listening to bach and just replaying that but they right. cannot improvise on the spot but jazz musicians the way there's a book by david epstein called range and we were talking about how jazz musicians will get it wrong 50 times but then the 51st time they will never forget it and that's how they learn with a lot of uh, trial and error so uh, how is that like true. The, i mean it's yeah. true with indian classical music as well you know the way we learn and the culture of how like uh information and music is passed down you know jazz is as well actually a very oral oral tradition you learn from watching others and seeing each other play mm. and learning how people approach music i mean it's like when you go to you think about school you know you think about like mugging up a textbook like mm. how many people could write an essay in english um by just like mugging up sentences and then when somebody's asked to write their own essay it would be impossible like you don't have yeah. a voice you don't know you never thought about it that way so yeah it's funny you I don't guess, have a voice you just yeah. have mugged up other voices that you thought so were so it's the end goal yeah. what is the end goal of being able to learn words or music for that matter the end goal should be that you can develop an original voice of your own and in mm. that case the way we're learning is often wrong because it's not really helping develop those skills at all so when it comes to playing with people who aren't improvisers um it can be challenging but i think it's mm. like down to the person who's leading that um to understand where people are coming from and it becomes a lot about just like you know um knowing what people are good at and what people are bad at and also mm. making sure that everybody feels comfortable mm. in this kind of creative environment because i do believe that if you feel like safe in your creative environment everybody will be ready to take risks in their music whether you ever improvised before or not it doesn't matter like if i say to you like you know you've never made music but look whatever comes out of your mouth right now yeah don't worry i got your back i'll make it sound good you know mm. and you might feel like theek hai i'll do something you know i'll take a risk you might feel like yeah fine and that's kind of where i'll that's the way i would approach a situation like that be like yeah okay mm. let's do it let's make people feel safe and trust this process of making music hmm. and that's my end goal you know i'm never going to tell people what to play hmm. cuz people have spent their whole careers learning music yaar who am i to tell them what to play like it doesn't make any sense to me that idea of telling people what to play at some level yeah um it's more about just having that conversation with people in a room yeah and i'm yeah, a very the- amateur guitarist uh, but um i've been very fortunate to have <clears throat> sort of friends who encourage me to make a lot of mistakes and and uh, and as a result i whatever capacity i learned in i also played in a couple of college bands at college and uh, really simple punk punkish bands and whatever capacity i was able to create was because uh, there was room for a lot of errors and mistakes yeah. and 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 screams that sounded like blood curdling screams horrible screams and you know like stuff that <clears throat> like you would not hear an indian or like anyone for that matter just just say in a polite setting 
or like sounds that you would never hear but all of since all of that is accepted some beautiful stuff is created even if that's like uh, a couple of friends and i just rap for fun we're not rappers trained rappers but we have a couple of workers we sit in a car we play some free you know some beats and we we try to freestyle and you know everything goes and what that means is after a certain point the sort of bragging aspect the the, the polished aspect of who we want to present ourselves at uh, as gets just it just get it just goes away and then the real subconscious shit that's inside us comes out about you know like frustrations aspirations right. stuff that we've never vocalized never articulated and it only happens because we we know that this rap session will not leak anywhere else it's just between right. us so people end up saying stuff they would never dream of saying and everyone right. goes home happy well that's it and those sessions you know are so important man like they're important to be had whether that's something that you record and put out as a music cd or it's just something that you have with a bunch of friends in a car hmm. you know like it's ultimately about creativity and expression so if you are able to have those great because everybody needs those and some of us have like gotten into the trap of making money out of those sessions and that's what's mm. made us musicians you know and there's a lot of good and bad things that go with that you know selling of creativity and culture you know yeah um so yeah man that sounds great um and yeah <laughs> i sort of do the same thing or try to do the same thing in musical situations with uh, with people hmm what do you, what do you think about the movie whiplash have you watched it actually i haven't watched whiplash man yeah like i've uh, oh, you love it off a lot of people by not yeah. watching it so i i i want to continue pissing off people <laughs> because uh, everyone's like what you know what how could you not watch people last year yeah. drama you play jazz i was like yeah no watched it <laughs> so, yeah i mean i i was going to have a question for you about how well okay, i'll give you without giving you a spoiler i'll give you like a brief idea of like it's, it's basically i think i know what yeah. it's about so it's yeah, not yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah but is is the whole training process for being a jazz drummer really that grueling that you know you you bleeding from your hands and stuff and you're sort of like self worth is on the line i mean again like anything i'm sure there's ways there's there's places where it can be that grueling but mm. for you i mean for not, you especially no for me definitely not absolutely mm. not for me uh learning music was always like uh was joyous mostly you know like of course there's like academic institutions where there's very narrow definitions of how uh what music is good and how to succeed in music and right. that can always lead to frustration but equally no like i practice by myself you know for 4 or 5 hours a day in like in a practice room but that was just me because i was interested in it and you'd be pushed by your peers and stuff but it was never that hyper competitive and of hmm. it's not true for me anyway it's not true hmm. what other artists in the indian scene do you look forward to collaborating with like people you're excited about um i don't know about collaborating but like i look out for a lot of music and that i really love i love lifafa it's my mm. favorite yeah he was on this podcast as well yeah yeah so lifafa is my probably my favorite mm. like in, i like malfunction a lot mm. yeah adi um i like ocean tide mm. a lot um yeah who else comes to mind Sanaya is a good really good friend of mine Sand Dunes Sand Dunes uh, yeah someone who yeah we've been talking about doing stuff together um yeah those four maybe mm. um i i mean i'll still i think constantly collaborate with uh, Aklesh the MC Mawali yeah, he's yeah. someone i've really found a connection with uh, more than any other rapper on the album um he's been coming and like we were trying to get him here as well we had a gig here mm. in November which is not happening but he was going to come uh for a whole bunch of shows here um and i really admire him and i think he's he's a really really distinctive voice hmm. uh, even in the rap scene in in india like what he's saying the way he's doing it his delivery his flow um is unique yeah you know it's funny uh i had no idea that <clears throat> i would meet you and talk about mc mawali cuz I go to rock climbing in Delhi there's this uh, giant boulder formations uh and uh, I had no idea these guys were like homies with uh, MC Mawali and one day I saw a story and I wasn't there I was like otherwise I would have met him 
got him on the podcast yeah. as well. But yeah, it's it's just a small he's world. A big boulder, rock climber. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he definitely it. has the physique for it as well. And yeah. um, yeah. Yeah, no, he talks about it a lot and he loves, he just loves the outdoors, man. Like, you should, he's funny for a rapper. Like, you look at his Instagram, it's all just mm. flowers and leaves and like <laughs> trees and mountains. And it's great. Like, I love people like that. You know, it's just like, yeah, it's not about the whole, like, I don't know, picking yourself up, gold chain vibe. It's yeah. just like, he's into that. That's his vibe. And he's a fire, fire rapper. So, that's yeah. what, you got to respect it. Fantastic. Yeah, he's a lovely guy. Yeah, Sarathi, if uh, if you have any questions for me, you can ask me. Otherwise, we'll uh, say sayonara for today. Cool. I mean, so where are you at right now? I'm uh, I'm in New Delhi. I was living New in Delhi. Mumbai at a podcasting. I was working at a podcasting company. Thing was not the thing for me. Quit, came back home, uh, saved saved a lot of brain drain because uh, all the people returned back, and I've just been here doing these podcasts. That's it. Sounds good, man. I'm going to check out more of them uh, because I've enjoyed talking to you. So let's... Uh, Thank you, yeah, man. man. Thank you. I'll check them out. They're on Spotify, right? They're on, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah. It's no, okay. it's been, it's been a blast talking to you. It's, it's so light and, and relaxing too. Cause you know, I'm not like, I'm not a musician. The one reservation I had was like, fuck, I'm, I, I don't know, like the, the, the lingo to associate with Sarthi, but um, yeah, you're, you've also been a great conversationalist in this uh, podcast, man. So thank you. Yeah, man, I never really like talking about music technically anyway, because like I hardly do, even with people who are like musicians, like my band, we never really yeah. talk about notes and like so how do you, time signatures. So how do you we do talk it? about feelings? We talk about like, we talk about what it is that we want to convey to people. Because ultimately, like we're talking to people who don't understand music. So like often it'll be like, we need some anger. We need some like fire in this tune. Like, of course, there will be some musical chat, you know. Yeah. Um, But often especially when we're not talking about that physical song like we never talk about music in 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 the sense of like technicalities because that's almost just doing it a disservice man like music is so much more than that and that's how it affects us and it's affected me as as a young kid growing up listening to music and like that i never knew how to describe music in very technical terms then and it still affected me and in fact like going back to the beginning of our conversation how i was saying mm. that in many ways music affected me much more then than it does now most you know? people yeah so yeah i mean technique comes with its own you know problems i can't help but, but uh think about this sid barrett experience that he had with pink floyd back when he was like full-on schizophrenic he he describes something like he told the band he stopped playing midway he's like let's make the middle a bit more afternoonish at the moment, it sounds windy and icy, and obviously David Gilmore and and you know the rest could relate to him. But um, I'm getting a feeling that so you guys just discuss emotions and hope that you all agree on what anger sounds like in a jazz song. So is, we is know that... each other really well. Okay, this yeah. really you can't just go to somebody random and say, "Hey, bro, let's make some like afternoon, <laughs> three p.m. sun." You know, I don't know, like cold winter afternoon music. It's not gonna yeah. work. So. All this is said amongst people who you have a relationship with already. And, you know, like with Floyd, they have relationships, they're a band. It's the same with me, you know, it's like mm. the kind of conversation you have with your best friend is going to be different from the conversation you have with somebody you've just met. Like people who will get what you're saying because they know where you're coming from or whatever, they know you. Um, so with my band and with people I play with, it's like talking to really, really good friends. You know, mm. think of it that way. That's the best way to do it, I think. Fantastic. Sarathi, where can people find you and your music? They can find me physically in my house in London, but I don't recommend it because it's COVID. <laughs> but they can find my music and like me on social media everywhere. The mm. usual, you know, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. And um, yeah, connect. Um, just check out my music. It's on all the other streaming websites. I, I would recommend checking it out on Bandcamp if you mm. can, because they um, give the musicians the most money instead of Spotify and Apple Music. But yeah, hey, you know, do your thing. Yeah, and, it's been lovely having this conversation with you, brother. Uh, take care. And when COVID ends, I'll definitely give you a visit wherever you are in London and uh, talk a bunch more about stuff. Maybe do something live, all of those things.
Great man, yeah. Hopefully, uh, we'll also be in Delhi soon to play. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, every year, so I'm looking forward. To I'll, I'll I'll bring a big crew. I, they'll be a bit belligerent, but I can promise some That's some great. good times. Yeah. Well, we'll promise a good time as well, man. Fantastic, so, yeah, brother. Man. Take All right. care. Take care, man. Bye bye. All right. Bye.